Hello, welcome everybody. Am I too loud? Is that too loud? No? Um, my name is Caitlin Thompson, um, and I'm doing um, this talk on psychedelics as a novel approach to treating autoimmune conditions, uh, which I think is pretty darn cutting edge. So, like a lot of people's um, inspiration to study or work in a field of something, mine started with my own personal story. I had struggled with depression and anxiety a lot of my life, and um, I didn't realize that uh, some other symptoms I had were related, such as chronic fatigue and um, joint pain, muscle stiffness, and uh, just an overall sensitivity and um, fragility to a lot of things. I wasn't very resilient to stressors. And um, it was, I was in my, uh, my last year of my neurobiology degree at San Diego State University, and I, up until that point, I had been exploring a lot with psychedelic compounds. I'd been part of the Burning Man community and um, going to the jungle to drink ayahuasca, and I was using them pretty consistently and doing pretty well health-wise and staying fairly happy. And it was um, when I got kind of busy with the harder classes that I, I took a step back from partying and, and thus psychedelic use. And I realized that at the seventh to eighth week mark after my last psychedelic experience, I would start to kind of chemically unravel um, clock, like consistently, like clockwork. And I would just get more irritable and felt physiologically imbalanced. And I, I said, something's going on with my, my physiology because circumstantially nothing has changed in my life. And that's when I kind of discovered that I had actually been self-medicating with psychedelic compounds pretty effectively. Um, but I wanted to get to the root of it and understand what was causing this in the first place. And I kind of spiraled down, excuse me, down this rabbit hole of um, you know, scientific literature on mood disorders and inflammation and um, autoimmune conditions. And it took me um, about three years of going through my own health journey before last November I finally got um, the diagnosis of you know, Lyme disease and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth as well as a number of gut and central nervous system infections. So needless to say I've become obsessed with autoimmunity and I'm marrying my passions of psychedelics and um, healing autoimmune conditions and this is where it led me. So what is an autoimmune disease? Well, um, in a nutshell, it's your body attacking itself. It's your immune system uh, has become very confused and it starts to attack and destroy healthy tissues. And when we see this, uh, it can be expressed in a number of different organ systems and symptoms that are autoimmune diseases. So you can see this, um, oh, sorry. Is there a Sorry, I wasn't controlling the slides. <laughs> All right, so as you can see, this woman is um, punching herself in the face. Yeah, that sums it up. <laughs> so um, autoimmune conditions pose a global health crisis. Uh, chronic illness, which encompasses autoimmune diseases, um, is the most severe threat to our global economic development. According to the autoimmune associated um, Disease Association, uh, we spend more than $100 billion annually on treating autoimmune conditions. And it's probably actually um, a bigger number because this was taken in 2011 and since then autoimmune um, diseases have been increasing. And this is also only taking into account the top seven um, of autoimmune conditions when there's actually over 100 that have been characterized at this point. To give you an idea of how much money that is, that is uh, more than the GDP of the six wealthiest countries combined. A lot of money. Uh, so there's an, some big data suggests that there's about 10 to 20 percent of the people in the world are affected by some sort of autoimmune disease, and in America, it's more like 30 percent. So we have approximately 50 million Americans suffering with autoimmune conditions. To give you some perspective. Um, we have about uh, 9 million Americans suffering with cancer and 22 with heart disease. So 50 million with autoimmune diseases. And yet, um, we're spending a lot of money on cancer and heart disease, which is important, but I think we need to also look at autoimmune conditions. 
And while they all have different symptoms and names and affect different systems in the body, um, they have a shared etiology. Uh, generally, the mechanism the origin is consistently similar in all these different diseases. So some examples of autoimmune conditions, fibromyalgia, Crohn's disease, IBD, colitis, celiac disease, multiple sclerosis, eczema, lupus, autism, um, rheumatoid arthritis, ALS, ankylosing spondylitis, Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, um, type 1 diabetes, and actually they are reclassifying type 2 diabetes right now as um, an autoimmune condition, and there's many more. Um, some characteristics that we see consistently in autoimmune conditions are rampant and ex excessive inflammation and oxidative stress, which is results in being really um, in pain and damaging tissue. Um, the mitochondria, which generate energy for our cells, are generally really screwed up and are creating a lot of free radical compounds contributing to this ex um, oxidative stress. And um, the immune system shows characteristics of being both hypervigilance and also immune suppressed. So in some areas it's working overtime, in others it's, it's not doing a good job of defending our bodies. And um, this is also accompanied by often a dysregulated immune system, mostly um, a sympathetic you know, stress response. The person is, you know, becomes so inflamed that their, their nervous system is under stress constantly. And this can lead to a number of different symptoms, such as you know, psychiatric conditions and gut problems, digestive issues, food sensitivities, uh, chronic fatigue, skin problems like eczema, um, sensitivity to pain as in you know, fibromyalgia, and uh, joint pain, um, brain fog, or just poor cognition, and susceptibility to infections. And these are kind of the things that um, show up before somebody gets a concrete diagnosis of an autoimmune condition. By the time um, someone's showing symptoms enough to be uh, diagnosed by the Western model, this has been going on for a long time in their bodies. You don't just wake up overnight with an autoimmune condition. It takes a lot of time for the body to start you know, damaging itself and um, reach that state of, of imbalance. So what causes autoimmunity? Well, it's a variety of things. But I would say, um, you know, predominantly environmental factors are really what's responsible for triggering an autoimmune disease. Yeah, there's some genetics that make people more or less uh, susceptible, but in general, it's an environmental triggers, and something called leaky gut occurs in almost everybody with an autoimmune condition, but unfortunately, I won't have time to really talk about leaky gut. So, um, overall, I would say the theme of the cause of an autoimmune disease is a chronic stressor of some sort. And this can be a variety of stressors. Um, you know, having a chronic infection is a stressor to the body. Um, and, you know, we have these, these microbiomes that are consisting of, you know, trillions of different organisms that play a crucial role in our health. I would say they, they kind of dominate and dictate our state of health. And um, when that ecology is off in our guts, it can cause a lot of problems. It can cause issues with um, you know, food absorption and inflammation and uh, production of neurotransmitters and affect aspects of our personality even. And uh, so any sort of chronic infection or dysbiosis is gonna cause chronic stress on the body, Lyme disease, for example. Um, also emotional trauma. There has been some research that really um, shows a significant link between you know, childhood emotional trauma and the development of an autoimmune disease as an adult. For example, a majority of uh, people who have fibromyalgia are women, and um, approximately 65% of women with fibromyalgia report uh, having sexual abuse as a child. That's a, there's something there to, to investigate. Um, and there's, there's also been some studies that look at uh, people who have something called um, adverse childhood experiences. And with, with people that had uh, three or more adverse childhood experiences, they had a 60% more likelihood to be hospitalized for an autoimmune disease um, into their adult life. 
So, you know, I really believe that um, that's something to be explored more, looking into emotional trauma and how it uh, is stored in the physiology um, of the nervous system and how that the, um, affects, you know, and creates these prolonged immune responses in people that can make them susceptible to developing an autoimmune condition. Um, also a big one, exposure to toxins. Um, there are toxins everywhere at this point. I think we come into this world with uh, an average of 200 synthetic man-made chemicals um, as soon as we're born, you know, out of our mother's bodies. So there's toxins in the air, in the water we drink, in the pillows we sleep on, in the plastic, you know, containers that we put our food in. Um, we have food toxins, we have, you know, pesticides, preservatives, and, you know, even proteins in various foods, such as like wheat and dairy, are toxic to a lot of people. And um, also, you know, diet plays a huge role. If you're eating a lot of sugar and junk food, um, you're going to have a lot of glycated end products, which uh, create oxidative stress and are therefore toxic to the body to some extent. And mold. Mold is a huge trigger of autoimmune conditions. I'll see a lot of people end up having mold exposure or mold sensitivity who develop these illnesses. So I just want to touch real quick on... Um, acute versus chronic inflammation. So acute inflammation um, is very important to the body's healing process. It's very necessary. You know, you, you um, sprain your ankle or something, your, your joint swells up, and it's, it's your body going to work and repairing whatever tissue's been damaged. But when the inflammatory process is prolonged, it doesn't serve you. It actually starts to damage tissue. And that's what we see in autoimmune conditions is this prolonged chronic inflammation response. So, um, how are psychedelics related to all this? Well, um, just to kind of give you guys an overview, I'm sure a lot of it's review, but the classical psychedelics, they typically act on the serotonergic system, the 5-HT, um, you know, receptors, and there is an abundance of literature looking at serotonin and its ability to modulate the immune system and inflammatory processes in the body. And so one could infer that perhaps psychedelics might be playing a role in this as well. And uh, the 5-HD2A receptor, which is uh, the most popular target of these psychoactive substances, uh, is densely um, in mammal, excuse me, mammalian lymphoid tissue. Um, also, you know, some of these receptors that the psychedelics are binding to, um, they cause calcium fluctuations in the cell, which affect the release of transcription factors such as mitogen activating protein kinase, and um, nu nuclear factor kappa B. And both of those play a role in um, regulating gene expression of the various things that are involved in processes such as cell survival, proliferation, and inflammation. Um, I know nuclear factor kappa B um, is directly correlated with um, the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And downstream from you know all this uh, serotonergic activity, we're seeing the modulation of um, the glutamate uh, system as well. And as uh, Shannon Connolly mentioned earlier, uh, glutamate cytotoxicity is a big problem, especially in autoimmune uh, pathology. And we also see a lot of these substances upregulate neurotrophic factors, which are basically nerve growth factors that prompt the growth and survival of um, you know, new neurons, dendrites, and synaptic cells. So just to show you real briefly, um, you can see serotonin on the left, and then you see these psychedelics that are very similar to serotonin, which is why they uh, act on the same receptors. So LSD, oops, I think I skipped one, there we go. So DMT, um, you know, binds to a variety of serotonergic receptors. Um, again, a lot of the uh, hype is about the 5-HD2A receptor. And it is also a sigma-1 agonist, uh, which, you know, you probably learned a little bit about earlier as well. And sigma-1 uh, has a lot of implications in um, controlling mitochondrial function and cell processes like apoptosis and survival and proliferation. And uh, we found that sigma-1 directly, um, or I guess downstream, modulates these transcription factors that I uh, mentioned earlier play a role in cytokine production. And there's been some in vitro studies that show anti-inflammatory effects of DMT by uh, decreasing interleukin-10, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine, um, 
oh sorry, this one it increases IL-10 and decreases some of the other interleukins such as um, 1 beta, 6, and TNF alpha, um, as well as IL-8. And there's been some evidence that they increase natural killer cells, which um, are responsible for scavenging uh, abnormal cell types like cancerous cells and uh, viral infections. And again, DMT upregulates this um, neurotrophic effect of, of sprouting new dendrites and synaptic spines. LSD is um, probably one of the most promiscuous of the psychedelics. It binds to a lot of different receptors, um, most of the serotonergic receptors, and uh, basically all the dopamine and adenosine receptors. Um, there has been some evidence that it also inhibits some of these pro-inflammatory cytokines that are secreted by B cells. And uh, interestingly enough, I think in the in the seventies or so, they did you know so many biochemical experience, experiments. And um, they found that high doses of LSD seem to inhibit natural killer cells, whereas low doses seem to um, increase them. So I think there's some implications for uh, microdosing LSD as far as boosting the immune system. And then we've seen with some other phenylethylamines, such as DOI, um, that there is reduced TNF-alpha-associated cytokines being released. Um, and we know this is via the 5-HD2A receptor activation because if you give the rats a drug to block this receptor, they do not um, see this, this observed. So um, granted, there is uh, some binding differences between DOI and LSD. DOI is a pretty, pretty full uh, agonist to the 5-HD2A, and uh, LSD is more of a partial agonist, about 30%. Now, ketamine is not a uh, classical psychedelic, but I thought it was worth mentioning here because it does show some immune modulating properties. Um, ketamine is uh, most understood for its, its NMDA antagonism properties, and so it blocks um, this type of glutamate receptor. And uh, there is some evidence that it's neuroprotective because, as I mentioned before, glutamate excitotoxicity is an issue and it does um, perpetuate the inflammation and the damage from oxidative stress that's happening in these autoimmune conditions. And uh, some suspect that the blocking of the NMDA receptor is actually redirecting glutamate to some of the other um, glutamate receptors such as kinates or AMPA and modulating that system and therefore decreasing the hypersensitivity of these glutamate receptors. There's also some um, monoamine activity from ketamine, um, you know, activating serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, which again um, are immune modulating neurotransmitters. And as well as uh, DMT um, also upregulates BDNF, brain derived neurotrophic factor, so prompts the sprouting of new neurons and dendrites and such. So, this is an area that virtually no one has touched on, and uh, it's looking at psychedelics effect on the microbiome. And I wish I could talk more about the microbiome because it's such a fascinating subject, but um, more or less there is this very strong axis between the gut and the brain. And um, we find that the, the microbiome populations in our, in our gut basically dictate the health of our brain. And um, if somebody is able to take a psychedelic and kind of recalibrate their nervous system, that sends signals down to the gut, which will influence um, what gut environment results, which will influence what type of microbes live there. So there's this direct interaction, two-way street between the gut and the brain. And um, I believe that psychedelics are really good at sort of recalibrating the nervous system and improving vagal tone, which again will um, help affect the microbiome environment and also uh, digestion and extraction of nutrients. Um, I came across a paper that looked at harming uh, as an antiviral agent against herpes simplex 2 virus. And the paper also briefly mentioned that it had some apparent antifungal and antimicrobial and antioxidant properties, so that could be an implication in um, helping to control uh, intestinal overgrowth that might have happened, and also, um, you know, antioxidant upregulation to combat the oxidative stress that we're seeing in these autoimmune conditions. Uh, also so shows an increase of natural killer cells 
um, to combat viral and anti-cancer effects. Um, as many of you probably know, psychedelics have very potent uh, emotional effects. A lot of people feel like they resolve their emotional traumas using psychedelics. And again, you know, when you have a traumatized person, their nervous system kind of gets stuck in this stress response. So psychedelics could really help kind of unravel um, this chronic sympathetic overdrive in the nervous system. And um, we also see that psychedelics can induce spiritual experiences, these mystical experiences. And there is some evidence linking, you know, spiritual practice and spiritual um, involvement in psychological well-being. So, in summary, um, psychedelics show potential to affect uh, the immune system and the inflammation processes in the body by modulating them. And uh, this happens via the uh, serotonergic system and the sigma-1 receptor activation and downstream you know, effects on calcium levels in the cells and thus uh, transcription factors and how they mitigate or, or, you know, release cytokines that cause inflammation in the body. Um, you know, this results, again, in reduced inflammatory processes and oxidative stress, which is a byproduct of inflammation. So it's kind of like this vicious cycle. And um, they show neuroprotective and, and neuroregenerative effects and potential microbiome effects. And they help resolve emotional trauma and they promote spiritual well-being. Those sound like all really good things to do for someone's healing. Um, and I just wanted to mention too that while I think psychedelics are um, hugely, hugely beneficial and have a lot of potential, I don't think that they are the answer to autoimmune conditions. Like, I don't think that they will, on their own, cure an autoimmune condition. And to be honest, I don't think any modality on its own will cure an autoimmune condition. I strongly believe that you have to utilize multiple healing modalities to really fix um, such a global, you know, problem in the body. Uh, it takes, you know, when, when, when you develop an autoimmune condition, it's because more than one thing has gone wrong. It's not a simple target. And so I encourage people to really look at what the root of their problem is. Do they have an infection? Do they have a chronic stressor, such as a, a shitty boss at work that's causing them stress every day? Are they being exposed to mold? You know, if you don't remove those things, it doesn't matter if you're microdosing every day to modulate your immune system. You have to get rid of whatever is causing the autoimmune condition in the first place. Um, but I think it's, you know, a good start to look at psychedelics as uh, a really potent tool to do this because they have um, these physiological, emotional, and spiritual effects. And I believe that all three of those things really needs to be addressed in order to fully heal somebody with an autoimmune condition. So, you know, we looked at emotional trauma and the microbiome and, you know, I, nutrition is a huge part of autoimmune condition. Um, diet, exercise, these lifestyle features, and, you know, social relationships, are they part of a community? We need to look at all of these things and somehow integrate psychedelics into them as uh, one of many tools that we should utilize. Um, just real quickly, this is um, the functional medicine model matrix. And I don't know if you can really see it, but on the outside it has all these features of the physiology, such as you know, energies, like are the mitochondria producing energy? Or um, transport, like are the, are the, is the blood, you know, are blood vessels um, transporting nutrients effectively? But in the center of all this is the mental, emotional, and spiritual states of the person. And I don't believe that a person can achieve full physical healing unless those three things are also addressed and in balance. So um, I just wanted to quickly say I'm seeking uh, partners and collaborators and funders for some, um, some new scientific research that I would like to move forward with looking at psychedelics in immune modulation and inflammation and hopefully um, autoimmune diseases uh, you know, implicated at some point. So if any of you are interested, then please come find me after the talk and you're, you know, feel free to email me or visit my website. And thank you all for your attention.
was wondering, did you happen to go to the MAPS event or watch any of the online content that's available from the MAPS event that just went on? Yes, I was there. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Did you get to see Dennis's talk about Harmala and Harmaline and all the different derivatives and what they're doing with that in respect to exactly what you were talking about? Oh, no, I wish. I was stuck in the clinical track it's, the whole I'm pretty time. sure it's <laughs> online and all their stuff on yeah. YouTube, but it directly addresses a lot of research that was cutting edge, and he was asking for people to jump in there. So oh, I just okay. really connected the two dots. Cool. Thank you for that. With the specific neuroreceptors and how to affect things like um, chronic inflammation, diet problems, etc., and also how there are, if I'm not misunderstanding what I read, because he was very dense, um, they can be tailor-made. They can be messed with just a little bit to actually create more effective delivery to attract, uh, to affect, you know, specific systems inside of those problems. Cool. So I just, you're on an awesome track and I want to connect the dots. Oh, thank you. No, I'll look into that. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering uh, if you had an opinion on the theory that uh, the reason why we have a lot more autoimmune disorders now is as a result of children being raised in a more sterile environment, uh, not exposed to uh, bacteria, viruses, things like that, that you'd see outside playing around, that sort of thing? Um, that's certainly part of the equation. I don't think any one thing is responsible. I think it's multifactorial. And, you know, I think we have a lot of antibiotic overuse. Um, we have kids in sterile environments. Uh, we have an abundance of toxicity in this world um, and in the food we eat. You know, the pesticides that we consume kill our microbiome as well. And um, we live in a sort of stressful, socially toxic world as well. So I think there's a culmination of factors that are contributing to the rise of autoimmune conditions. Okay, that's all the time we have for questions. We're going to keep moving on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.